Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to this conversation with an exceptionally talented um, group of artists, writers, and cultural workers on the topic of this, there is no time, or there is, brackets, no time. Um, today, uh, we have with us Annika Bello, Jade Foster, um, Seda Ergul and Tuna Erdem from the Istanbul Queer Art Collective, Jade Montserrat, Gabrielle de la Puenta and Zarina Mohammed from the White Pube and myself, June Lingo. I believe you've already heard from Performing Borders and Live Art Development Agency. So thank you everyone for making time on a Sunday um, in a particularly difficult transition point between lockdowns um, and a transition in seasons. Um, today, what we're going to do is um, we're going to ask each of our contributors to introduce themselves and um, their residencies. So they'll each have about five minutes to speak. And then we'll go into questions around uh, related to time. And then we also have time to go into Q&As from the audience or also the other contributors. Um, so if you do want to ask a question, if um, on your screen you can uh, make it a full screen in the right hand corner, there should be uh, what I'm told is a bubble icon and that is the chat function. And in the chat function, maybe write question in capital letters and then what your question is for ease. So that's, that's all the admin. Um, and let's start off hearing about um, the Performing Borders residencies. So if I could ask Annika to begin. Thanks, June. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Annika Bello, and I'm a writer and founder of Oranika.com, which is a space I created online to talk about pre-colonial African history. And that was very much the theme for my residency with Performing Borders. I, before everything went down in March, I was really lucky enough to travel to Benin and Nigeria at the start of the year. And that, that trip really offered me an opportunity to reflect on ancestry. And I felt inspired to create a piece on the topic of fluid borders. And I think it's really interesting because when you think, when I sort of think about a border, I think about its riddedness and the fact that like, you know, it's, it's, these, it's these kind of um, lines that are sort of dotted across um, countries or maps telling you where you, should and where you shouldn't go. And the essay I used as an opportunity to sort of show how culture reveals just how fluid borders can be. And it was from the experience of me going to Benin, a country that I've never visited before, a country that I have like no sort of family, direct family ties to, I was able to sort of find or sort of see aspects of home in, in the places that I went to and the people that I met and the culture that I engaged with. And Benin is right next to Nigeria and it has a really interesting history in terms of pre-colonial times showing how sort of fluid borders were because of the sort of Benin Empire and uh, Oyo Empire of the Yoruba people. So that was what my essay was, was exploring. And I, sp I speak about my personal experiences as well in the, in the piece because I was undocumented for, uh, for the, like the first 10, 11 years of my life in the UK. And yeah, it offered me a chance to sort of talk, unpick the concept of borders, of what it means to be a migrant, but also what it means to, yeah, to be fluid and to be able to sort of embrace different identities. So I really enjoyed writing that piece and it was nice to sort of check out the other contributions from previous um, residencies uh, that Performing Borders have, have created. And I'm gonna, I'll stop there. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Annika. Jade Foster? 
Hi everyone, um, I'm Jade Foster. Um, I'm an artist, curator, creative producer um, based in Nottingham. I am also, I work independently, but I also work at New Art Exchange based in Nottingham and Primary um, as the assistant curator. Um, so I did a, I did a curator in residence um, with Performing Borders and I was looking at live art practice, particularly working with um, kind of black and brown artists, curators, working in kind of performance, live art, sound. Um, and I was thinking from a borders as a, as not only something physical, but thinking about um, language borders, like how we communicate with each other. Um, and through this residency, I've been having conversations with artists, curators about their practice, but also about how we are generous with each other, how we share, how we, um, how we create spaces of rest. Um, and, and yeah, just kind of how we kind of navigate space um, within our kind of institutions, within, um, kind of our cities. Um, so I was kind of thinking about borders in a very um, broad way um, and had a really pleasure to kind of speak with a range of people and also be mentored by Adelaide Bannerman um, and resituating my practice in London as well, which gave me a really good opportunity to connect with people and artists that I would never probably be able to because uh, of resources or um, because of time etc but yeah that's me. Thank you Seda and Tuna. Hi my name is Seda and this is Tuna. Uh, we are the uh, founders of Istanbul Queer Art Collective and we founded the collective in 2012 in Istanbul Turkey um, it's only eight years ago, but I mean, it feels like a lifetime ago. I mean, it was, I mean, quite different times. <laughs> um, three years ago, uh, three and a half years ago, we moved to London from Istanbul. Um, and we become migrants, <laughs> migrant artists. And I mean, at the beginning, it was just a word, but uh, in time, it kind of sings and, I mean, changes changes you in many ways. Uh, so it becomes an identity. It becomes a part of yourself. Um, so what we did with uh, Performing Borders this year uh, was a digital residency uh, at the beginning of May. Uh, it has two parts. I mean, we we just delved into their extensive archive and we made a Instagram post uh, about their uh, past uh, collaborations. And other than that, Tuna every day just read a poem in our garden because it was the lockdown time. We weren't just very mobile at the time. And she just read a poem each day uh, and I mean, maybe you want to add something about it. Yeah. Yes, uh, I chose the poems from poets who were uh, who lived in countries that they were not born in, or wrote in languages that were not their mother tongue, uh, because that kind of sort of resonated uh, with our uh, situation. Uh, and we're called the Istanbul Queer Art Collective. We started out our um, performance work in Istanbul with a lot of people. That's why we're called a collective. Now we've sort of become a duo because we are migrants. We had to leave everyone behind. Actually, everyone went all over the world, uh, basically. Uh, so the lockdown itself felt like even uh, the same process getting more heightened, uh, basically. Uh, we were already like 10 people, 15 people when we started out, we moved here, we become a duo. And then with the lockdown, uh, 
the reading of the poems, for instance, I was doing the reading, she was doing the shooting, so it felt it was even more smaller because of that. But poetry was the only thing that was helping uh, in connecting with all this experience. So we wanted to share that and also to share other people's work that dwelled around the same subjects. So I guess this is about it, yeah. Super, thank you. Jade Montserrat. Thank you, thank you all. Um, uh, I'm, yeah, Jade Montserrat, an artist based in North Yorkshire. Um, and the residency for me, again, um, uh, I suppose, became a matter of connecting to the community that was um, available to work with me, essentially, um, Mafwa Theatre Group, um, based in Leeds, Bermontoff's Lincoln Green and Mabgate. I know Leeds um, sort of really uh, casually, I suppose. I It was the only place that I could go um, to get my hair done when I was younger. Um, uh, so it was really good to be able to connect um, knowing that we weren't going to be able to meet. Um, the residency itself was um, allowed me to think about how to make a, even an initial connection to make contact. Also to sort of discuss with others what essential needs are or um, uh, what brings us comfort um, and that culminated in buying um, uh, materials for packs that could go out with the uh, packs that MAFWA were sending to the community, including sort of digital access as well as uh, food. I, I, I just sent seeds and growing materials and um, sketchbook and charcoal, which is something that I used um, a lot. Um, like everything during this time, it's felt um, like there aren't enough resources or, um, there's not enough to give. Um, and so it's been a really um, rich time for me in that everyone was so responsive to the idea of <laughs> making simple connection um, with which to then allow me to work again with Web Ellis, um, my friends and colleagues, uh, filmmakers, um, and develop the um, ideas that we've been working on for a number of years um, in terms of our relationship and our collaboration. Um, and uh, yeah, it allows me then to use the residency as a sort of springboard which I suppose is how I view a lot of my work with which to then reflect and then um, uh, specify or pin down what it is that's the, the sort of core of it or the essentials um, that I can then speak about or disseminate further. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle and Zarina. Yeah we did a I feel like in comparison it was a little bit more of a selfish residency <laughs> um, whereby we took over the performing borders twitter account um, I should probably give an introduction first shouldn't I sorry I'll go backwards me and Zarina are art critics slash game critics slash sometimes Zarina writes about food now as well um, but we are pretty prolific on the internet so the invitation to do a Twitter residency made sense. We did a Twitter takeover of the Performing Borders uh, account. And yeah, it was kind of like a fast seven days in the beginning of July where we took turns and we went uh, through the archive and all the different articles and interviews on the website and made Twitter threads of our thoughts um, every day. And to yeah. be honest, it was quite interesting to 
like write in that way. I think often we write quite finished whole complete thoughts. I think those threads were they were like quite sporadic, quite um like scraggly, like they kind of you could kind of see thought process through and um it kind of meandered in a sense and just writing up against another person's words or work was like an interesting way for us to write because it's not always like that yeah and I think we like for me I think it was probably the most reading I did in lockdown which (laughs) because I didn't need to and no one was there to make me until this residency which I felt really like grateful for I felt like we were students again which was nice it was like a, a nice moment it was like a writing exercise actually wasn't it yeah yeah and there's yeah. there's still a lot of like artworks that we read about so there's I think there's one by Lynn Lu where she like floats she did like a durational performance in a New Zealand dock where she would like float face down in the water with you know it was all kind of like made so that she she didn't drown she had like a secret breathing apparatus um but like it's the f- performances like that and the images and the way she wrote she th- she wrote about it like that's still stuff that I'm thinking about now so I'm glad I'm glad that we did it thank you everyone for introducing your practices and what you've been up to with the performing borders residencies um let's 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 discuss <laughs> um one thing that um comes to mind when um I think about this provocation that's holding us together there is in brackets no bracket time is about the choice um and the choices that we're making about what to spend time on and what we choose not to spend time on and it reminds me of a um a I guess um a quote or a guidance from the writer Adrian Marie Brown and they say what we pay attention to grows and I'm really curious about how we've been dealing with time in in such a precarious moment um, and also how looking back at time gives us something different and I wondered if we could start off this conversation um, maybe with Annika and Jade, um, asking both of you, uh, what does exploring history, a lineage or ancestry equip us with today? Um, Annika, do you wanna do you wanna kick us off? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, it's interesting because it's felt as if there has been so much time and then there is like, yeah, no time. And so like in terms of how connect engaging with ancestry I feel that engaging with culture so cultural practices whether it's the food I'm eating music I'm listening to there's that's that thread that's connecting me to ancestry so that link between past and present and definitely in 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 this like this year I've really leaned on sort of what I think Jade and um, Jade Montserrat mentioned of going back to basics. So really focusing on what, what grounds me, what enables me to be present and whether it's food I'm eating or whether it's, yeah, films that I'm watching or just really just being with my family, those, those intimate moments of, of like my life are sort of helping me to connect with the past whilst being in, in the present and being able to sort of see, see this year um, and see everything that it's 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 brought up. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely what comes to mind when you the question you asked. And with Annika, you talk a lot about um, exploring yourself through a practice of um, discovering ancestry and lineage. Um, can you speak a bit more about that? Yeah, so so growing up in the UK, I wasn't particularly interested in, in ancestry or heritage or anything like that. I spent a lot of time thinking that it was almost like this, this barrier between me embracing my, my Britishness. And so, yeah, it, it felt like a, an annoyance. But 
it was only obviously like within, you know, entering my 20s, wanting to sort of just know more about, about where I'm from and things like that. And then that curiosity just leading me to different spaces, um, to questions with my family. And then that sense of almost like a coming, coming home in a way, um, that sort of full circle moment of, of wanting to, yeah, explore what, you know, the different elements of my ancestry, uh, whether it's through culture, I, I find that to be a, a, a easy gateway for me because culture is, informs everything that I do um, in, in my life. So that was, yeah, really helpful for me. Thank you. And Jade Montserrat, do you feel like you want to answer to speak to this as well? Sure, could you repeat what you asked? Thank you. Sure, I was asking, how does exploring history, a lineage or ancestry equip us for today? So what lessons, knowledge, learnings do we take from the past? Yeah, I think it's really vital. I'm a big advocate of sort of um, uh, in, inter um, disciplinary approaches to educating myself or certainly um and um i think yeah just in relation maybe to divert to digress a bit but um when we were talking earlier when we were meeting half an hour before this and we were talking about um television and um sort of reality shows um i get a um yeah, a sort of um, a very um, sort of the pang of um, despair, I suppose it could be around sort of then looking back at how those um, shows sort of form and it leads back to my research on Josephine Baker and then her, um, her I can't remember, I think it was with Langston Hughes that she was speaking with about having her own um, sort of reality show with her children on display at um, Chateau de Milan. And then, you know, you think about how someone like um, the president of the United States gets to power and how that kind of... So I suppose what I'm saying is uh, is answering to the question of um, now in relation to recent histories and uh, lineages from a personal point of view, um, I, I um, find it kind of... There's a blockage for me because um, my mother, for instance, still gets very upset and irate when anyone talks about, uh, um, uh, you know, at school, I was, uh, they did a, they asked children to um, draw out their family trees, things like that, which would scare the living daylights out of my mother, because of course, I don't know my father and this kind of thing she found really intrusive. She also found the idea of sort of families or in working working um, situations, if anyone sort of talked about that sort of family idea at all, uh, which I can understand as well, um, but it, for her it was really difficult. So I'm really catching up on my personal um, uh, ancestry and that I find um, sort of, uh, displacing as well you know the uh, personal history where I clearly don't belong where I, I live and that's been very made clear to me not something that um, I have courted in any way um, uh, but at the same time so dislocated and um, I think that um, it's just really helpful to be able to maybe make inroads on that kind of um, understanding of our own um, situations, if only for sort of health re reasons, right? So that you know what you might expect um, come, come in your life, uh, which is, you know, half of that, I, I have no clue at all. Um, yeah, I just think um, trying to make connections between our uh, 
collective histories and personal histories is um, generating new knowledges uh, and helping us to make decisions about how we um, rewild and world, I suppose. I wonder if this question of dislocation that a blockage in a family tree can have um, and what, what other blockages are happening or dislocations that are happening in our current lives. And I was really struck by um, um, Tunan Seda's comment um, that we are, that you are, you became a migrant and that was a new experience. And at first it's a word, but then it changes you in many ways. Um, and I have a, a really sick joke with a, a friend of mine who's um, a person that's recovered from cancer. And we always say, there is just two types of people, those who have had cancer and those who are going to have cancer and just don't know yet. So that's quite sick. Um, <laughs> but um, I equally think the same with migration and the experience of um, being a migrant. I think you're either a migrant or you're about to become a migrant. And I'm really curious about what kind of strategies that Tuna and Seda you took as you were transitioning into this new experience um, and how you faced um, a very hostile environment. What, what did you, how, what were your strategies? We made art. <laughs> That's the only thing we know how to deal with anything, basically. So we uh, made art uh, for actually performing borders last year about the hostile environment. Uh, we did this performance called uh, Moeba Stripping, where we uh, had to post that year to the Home Office uh, one and a half kilo of documents each. Uh, and we have to do that every year uh, to keep on being here. Uh, and we sort of sat down in this durational performance and cut up the documents in uh, strips and then turned them into moibus strips uh, where the inside and the outside is not obvious. Uh, so that was quite therapeutic, <laughs> I have to say, for instance, but in terms of what happened this year, we came to this country when both of us were 40 something, uh, quite uh, age wise. Uh, it's a late time to start from scratch, to begin anew in a place where you know no one. Uh, so everything that you've done up until that time uh, is sort of erased and you start again. So uh, this displacement is also like going back in time. Uh, we do feel a lot like teenagers starting out in life, uh, although we're like uh, in our mid 40s, I'm even 50 now. <laughs> so uh, yes, the change in space and change in time is interestingly uh, interconnected, uh, basically. And uh, of course, the perception of people, a lot of people here, is that we come from a place that is backwards in time, in the sense that people usually think there's this one line of linear development where every sort of culture goes through. And the culture that we came from is uh, in a backwards time, which is, of course, uh, ridiculous and is not true. Uh, but still, there is this very interesting sort of shift between time and space that we keep on experiencing. And I think lockdown has made other people experience that as well. There's a regression that comes with lockdown that sort of seems uh, like it as well. I don't know if you want to add anything to this. <laughs> I mean, um, when, when, when you, um, how can I put this? I mean, when your relationship with home changes, uh, when you, um, uh, um, lots of things change and one of these one, one of the main things that changes is the sense of time, I guess. So after, after we moved here, uh, after we became migrants, uh, I realized that I luckily, very luckily, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of privilege, I guess. I mean, we had a very, very stable lives. Um, I mean, mm, 
socially, mentally, I don't know, emotionally, economically, whatever. I mean, they were the, the life that we had before was, I mean, pretty sta stable. Uh, but when this uh, home, uh, sense of home uh, starts to change, it really uh, shatters your sense of time. I mean, it, uh, the time just becomes something fluctuating. I mean, just three months before feels like three years ago and sometimes just the opposite. I mean, five years ago feels like yesterday and you just, I mean, I personally lost that fluency in time, which comes, I guess, with stability. And becoming a migrant just um, produced new anxieties that I never experienced before. Uh, but uh, I, I was starting to get used to it uh, after, I mean, three years. And um, it's, it's kind of a high. And I was just trying to cope with that uh, thing. Uh, but then the uh, pandemic happened uh, and it, it produced this similar experiences. I mean, in kind of a different way. I mean, the relationship uh, of ourselves with our homes changed and that, I mean, uh, affected our sense of time and uh, new anxieties are produced kind of a thing. So this is kind of overwhelming for me right now and I cannot just put it in order in my mind, but yeah, I mean, being a migrant and living in this pandemic uh, uh, have some resonating feelings. This is what I feel now. I mean, I, I'm still in that thing, so I cannot just uh, think about it objectively. I am first of all feeling it, but this is what I feel, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know the conversation that we're having is in the middle of these experiences and feelings and emotions. And yeah, uh, I don't think any of us um, have comprehensive ways of summarizing or making those connections. And if we if we are, then we're lying <laughs> or simplifying. <laughs> so let's just sit with that super messiness. Um, but it, it is interesting to think about, yeah, the, the precarity that a migrant feels is, can, can be, can find similarities with the precarity that we're feeling um, in this moment um, of lockdown. And yeah, I, I was interested in what you were saying, like a fluency in time e equating to stability and not knowing how to deal with time equating then to some kind of instability. Um, Speaking on um, emotions and the spectrum of emotions that, that we might be feeling at this moment, um, Jade Foster, sorry, I'm, I'm calling both the Jades by their surname so we know who that we're talking to, but it sounds very formal. <laughs> but Jade Foster, in your residency, I was really struck by a question that you were asking. Um, and you, you quoted Toni Morrison saying, there is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. And you asked the question, how to hold space to sustain outrage and radical love in equal measure. And I think this is a tension that many people are feeling, how to, to kind of channel that rage, but then also channel that love. Um, and I wondered if you could speak more to this and what does it look like for you or, or what have you learned from asking this question? I think originally um, when I was thinking about that question, I was thinking about um, black people in this moment and how, um, what is expected of black communities in terms of our response to, you know, George Floyd, to kind of disproportionately how COVID is affecting black communities, to the kind of onslaught of, of um, expectations and just 
what people kind of put on you and what people kind of expect you to kind of handle respond to um and yeah I've just been speaking to a lot of people and the one emotion that comes across is exhaustion tiredness um it's both kind of feeling irritated by um like expecting to do the work you know in terms of expecting to educate other people expecting to um respond with kind of um with a kind of fighter energy or you know um to always be in resistance to something and resistance being something that is kind of um perceived to be um kind of intense or come from a place of anger come from a place of like a, a aggression but actually um you know I was speaking to Raju Rage um and it was really insightful and beautiful just to kind of have a space to talk um and one thing that came from that conversation is generosity um and I'm not talking about generosity with kind of non-black people I'm talking about generosity between ourselves um you know um and how we take care of each other how we take care of ourselves like what does collective care mean um being a really important thing um and how do how do we sustain that um and I think that creating networks and creating supportive systems that aren't operating within the kind of institutional violence that I'm going to speak about cultural workers that you know black brown cultural workers people of color are experiencing um creating systems outside of that where you can feel rested you can feel um that you're sharing uh care and being generous with each other I think that's what I mean by kind of sustaining radical love like I was in a conversation yesterday and someone kind of said that the most um the most kind of radical thing you can do for yourself is is get up in the morning and you know I don't know draw yourself a bath or kind of center yourself ground yourself um and yeah kind of all the conversations I was having with these artists and curators everyone was telling me just how they are tired of addressing a kind of current landscape in terms of like Black Lives Matter that, you know, it's exhausting. It's been, you know, it's pretty much been hyper, um, kind of hyper visible within this moment. And that with that hyper visibility comes um, extra pressure, extra stress, extra, you know, um, burden, I think on communities um so and then with the with the kind of sustaining um kind of radical kind of radical love and um kind of also sustaining a level of I wouldn't say anger but I would definitely say um sustaining the conversation beyond just a moment or you know it's it's not some that's fleeting it doesn't kind of come in and out and I think having these conversations with these artists is like what kind of structures enable us to kind of sustain that communication sustain that conversation um center ourselves you know like healing justice for example that's incredibly important in in kind of loving ourselves like what is the you know it's quite radical to love yourself when the world and you know um is telling you that you're not beautiful that you know it's telling you that you're um that you're angry black woman it's telling you that your life isn't valued constantly you know you're seeing imageries of black bodies dying or you know in pain constantly being circulated in social media and it's kind of like to to you know the the kind of um to hold a space for love and care is radical within this moment I think and really important and key so a lot of these conversations that I've been having is around 
slowing down is around creating these kind of stops for um, care, stops to have conversations that like Raji was telling me. I was asking them, what are you doing yourself for yourself in terms of care? And they were telling me um, cooking, gardening, you know, just spending some time outside, um, feeling wholesome in that way. And it's, you know, it's, it's those kind of conversations are as valuable um, and as needed you know, as a kind of um, political conversation or political discourse. So it's just finding that balance, basically, um, I think it's important, um, but yeah. Thanks, Jade. Yeah, really hear you about finding that balance and addressing exhaustion equally, um, equally as, uh, you know, the urgency of this moment in time and taking care of oneself. I wonder when, when, um, when you say these conversations are with black and brown colleagues, friends, bodies, um, that, that the, the trajectory of that energy is to take care of oneself. But I also wonder what is the role and how accountable um, decision makers need to be because they often take that same <laughs> stance but often when uh we are we are speaking or i am speaking or you are speaking there's a there's a specific audience that you have in mind and there are different roles that all of us play in a very complicated ecology which has very unequal power relations and if in your case one of the most important things is to heal restore and build those connections and those networks outside of those mainstream spaces I often wonder what are those mainstream spaces doing and how can they respond to this moment and what is their sense of time in it because often in those spaces the the, the language that I hear is we need to do this slowly when actually I wonder if a different timeline needs to be set for these spaces as well I wonder if um, Zarina and Gabrielle, um, you want to speak about the work that you that you have been doing to really amplify voices and challenges to um, many institutions currently, and how that's changed your role as um, critics or embodied critics or commentators or writers. I think you've kind of voiced something that we've we've been writing uh, about or around during lockdown I've had quite a prolific lockdown <laughs> when it comes to art like the institutional essays like the art thoughts um, that we publish I think in terms of the way we work it's been a politic that we've always held on to within like the website and writing about institutions and exhibitions like I've always like both of us have always kind of run up against the structure of a gallery and like you know all the baggage and like fun stuff that comes with having a registered charity number and like working in a specific way but it I think I, I don't know if we ever took the time to like nail it down in an essay and there have been a series of texts that we've written that have kind of made it explicitly clear where we politically stand and what we politically want from institutions. Like like how, <laughs> when we say that this is broken, what do we mean? And like, what do we want to see fixed? I think that's been what, I, what we've spent most of our time doing, which has been actually quite like, where this has been a, fr like a frustrating time, it's been really therapeutic to like, kind of put it in words and hear people can like respond to it in a way that like makes me feel like I'm not a crank. I think it's it's interesting like we so we've we started the website in 2015 and we got we had our fourth birthday l last year in London together and I remember we sat down together and we were we kind of are in this routine of okay what what do we want to do over the next year is there something that we should try and focus on or like you like new year's resolutions but for our school calendar year and it was just a realization of we've accidentally amassed this weird power <laughs> and a substantial audience 
so like we need to do something with it and we need to start to instrumentalize because otherwise what's the point like what we we write about these like flimsy exhibitions and whatever but and and that's kind of our art practice in a way but what's our political practice uh it it didn't it hadn't felt like anything was really visible enough at that point we we have done bits like there's there's bits on the website that i think manifest that in you know making the accounts public or stuff like that uh and i feel like zarina especially it, partially as well because you were london based uh this year is has been able to like attend protests and speak at protests and write about these things for me I, i've not felt as able to to give or to be as useful because it's been instagram and then i, I do forget how powerful that is like you know we jade uh we we kind of like helped amplify a little bit of that you know almost at the very like years later and straight away because the tate commented on the instagram post the guardian were able to write about something because the tate had been so slow to say anything publicly and and, and then the guardian again in touch to, to ask questions it's just all this and then you realize like okay this has taken place on a really strange so social media stage that at this point is having implications. So it's, I don't know, for me, I'm, I'm constantly, I feel like this strange guilt of like never doing enough and then because I'm not able to be in London at the protests and and then trying to remember that stuff does happen as a result of it. Mm. Um, yeah. It's always been something we've like kind of towed the line on, like feeling like oh my god we're not doing enough and like it's all spinning out of control that like mad kind of angsty frustration right of like not being able to affect the change you want to see in the world or like engineer a situation where like you and the people you love and care about have equitable terms of engagement with the places they're forced to work with like we have no choice this is where the money lies like financially like um how many people can say no to working with you know all these places that are kind of treating them badly and like not treating them on equitable terms but what is the alternative like I think in that frustration it kind of it feels like we're so unable to affect change but like it it, it kind of we've seen the pace at which it kind of unfolds <laughs> I think this summer and you're right it absolutely happens on at a glacial pace like it's so slow so slow and I think we've really seen the unwillingness at the heart of these institutions to change in any meaningful way. Like, um, like, the, like the Rex Whistler mural, right? Like they've been fannying about with that in ethics committees for years. They've known that it's an issue. They like, but it kind of, they, they, it, it, they're willing to wait for it to become newsworthy and I I'm not I think that's the bit that we haven't quite clicked yet like how do you fucking tell them to hurry up and do so in a way that endears them to do that like do they have to be willing participants in that because with all the Tate strikes like there was a uh, like uh, towards the end of the strike period there was an evening standard article where Maria Balshaw was like oh yeah the white people have been very unhelpful and made personal attacks about me going to the beach and it's like well hun like you're moving at a, 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 an incredibly slow pace and like how how do not just we but like how does any kind of collective sense of like art workers at large like, move that pace along when it's like you're being unhelpful now yeah. oh like, so I it feels her reaction to that also it, it kind of mirrors like Tories kicking off about the word scum yeah. where like is that really the issue like why are you why are you like building this victim you know identity around yourself when <laughs> no one's gonna buy that I think it's that figure of the cry bully right like um you're willing to like throw the weight around <laughs> and then cry when someone says oh can you not like recognizing these institutional patterns it's just clicked i wonder if anyone else um on this panel wanted to talk about how we move things on 
how we move that glacial speed for institutions, but also in equal measure, how we slow down for ourselves. I was just going to add uh, something off the back of Jade Foster, Jade, what Jade was saying. I listened to like an incredible podcast episode this week by, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but it's it's like a new podcast called Resistance by Gimlet. And one of the episodes is on the Warriors in the Garden protest group in New York. Uh, and they're kind of, energy of coming together to say well we want to we don't want to make we don't want to get to a point where this conversation drops off and that you know none of the protests are visible anymore we want to make sure that we're there every single time at every opportunity every vigil everything but the podcast was kind of asking ask them at the beginning of it really like how do you keep that going and if you put in this pressure on all the time like how do you, what do you do and <laughs> the response was like oh like you know once a week we just drink and it was like such a uh, just clean answer where they said, you know, we get together and there's this place that does like really cheap cocktails and we just drink. <laughs> and then the next day we're back on it. And it felt like it just, yeah, I just wanted to put that on. I put that out there before someone else picks up. <laughs> how to how to continue. I guess there are so many people currently putting pressure on in institutions, the white peeve, Jade Montserrat, there's, you know, collectives being formed, there's artists that are putting pressure, Evan Koya, um, you know, there's a lot of, like, open letters, you know, all these big institutions are being put to, you know, put on, put on kind of judgment, basically, um, and I think just, like, yeah, it's just how there needs to be, all these conversations need to be kept in the mainstream, they can't become fringe conversations they can't just be activists you know the same group of activists or artists or culture workers doing that work it needs to be a mainstream conversation um and I think that it kind of needs to be um yeah it's like who does the work kind of thing like you know it's not for just black and kind of people of color to do the work it's also you know, white culture workers, which is pretty much the majority of culture workers, you know, they need to pick up that work, they need to sustain that work. Um, institutions that say they're anti-racist, I'm going to put that in quotation marks, like if you're writing, you know, your BLM statement, you need to, you can't just do it internally, you need to also support independence as well, people outside of institutional spaces, um, I think that's as important um, and whatever you can just if you know yeah whatever you can just um, share you know um, and respond to and just be yeah create keep the conversation mainstream because it will you know I mean we're in Black History Month at the moment it's that thing of like why is there still a Black History Month like why is this you know why is not Black people in the conversation all year round it's that thing of like hyper visibility in one in one month and then it kind of drops off out of the mainstream conversation after October so it's the same thing in terms of it can't drop off it needs to be you know it needs to remain as a top priority um both for funders both for you know big organizations like ACE um and both for like culture institutions and you know from artists led to to multi you know yeah multiple like you know big institutions like Tate and and Somerset House and things like that um also um you know um it's always that thing of like you know like there are so many times I've walked on the street and someone has said a comment about my hair one time this uh this woman just like literally like jumped on me and then started touching my hair I'm not even lying like it was a night out and she jumped on me and started just literally like ragging my hair around and her boyfriend had to like pick her up and like remove her um and loads of people bystanders just watching you know on the street um and it's that same thing of like no one is deaf to what's happening Every, you know it's hyper visible but there's a lot of people that are currently just watching you know what I mean just kind of in the background they can't you can't hold that position anymore do you know what I mean? You can't hold that position of I'm just going to watch or somebody is being, you know, um, torn apart, you know, when you can see there's institutional racism, where you can see there's issues, um, you can't just watch, 
you know um and I think when you hold that position you're you're as complicit let's be honest in in it really um so I would say to anybody watching I'd say like also you know to like non-black people um white people you know just just call people out you know um and don't just be watch whilst things are happening around you be active get involved listen actively listen um and just ask what what can I do you know and also ask other white people what you can do so don't just put that on black people brown people etc to tell you what to do you know talk with your other white colleagues your other white cultural workers what can what should we do you know what I mean and have that conversation within yourselves as well so yeah just don't be bystanders to it all that's what I would say to kind of help sustain the conversation and keep it moving Thank you, Jade, Serena, Gabrielle. Um, we've got some questions uh, from the audience. Um, and the first one is from Cecilia. And the question is, if public institutions aren't gonna change, maybe the public needs to defund them, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, thoughts. I like, I, I spied that in the, <laughs> in the little doc and I was like, oh, like, yeah, I think, I think it's a, it's an it's an it's a trajectory on like an approach that we've kind of seen little glimpses of um i think this year like there was talk of the arts council introducing um like diversity quotas and cutting the funding of i think it was theaters or maybe wider institutions that um don't meet those diversity quotas and there's been like moves in the past from the arts council um like a few years ago all npos had to make their creative case for diversity but it was never quite defined what that would consist of and so you know in places like uh, the Tate past and places like you know that I'm aware of that have pretty good track records working with like pretty diverse artists and you know like they didn't quite make the cut so like that it, it the problem I think is with in some cases the problem lies with the funding body and I, I think the, the, we <clears throat> we kind of are able to see the way that the structure itself because like very often like the structure isn't really it's quite opaque it's not really visible it, it operates in a way that's very misty and foggy and like super um like you know mysterious and um I think recently we've been able to see like with the publicity around the funding waves as they come and the urgency of it um like we're able to see that like sometimes priorities are out of whack and the system through which our funding is distributed is kind of almost the problem. Um, the fact that the Arts Council is now a neoliberal organ that is meant to be at arm's length from the state but kind of simultaneously doesn't really do much to kind of disrupt or resist the state's own interests is a problem. Like the fact that I think it was the recent wave of uh, cultural funding like the arts council were pumping six figures into organizations that were backed by venture capitalists and like you know like was it six figures to boiler room like meanwhile community organizations are like community and grassroots organizations are like starved of funding like the way that this funding is being distributed is is almost the problem and i i think defunding them yes but like creating a new system through which that like funding structure can I don't know basically because I think the funding structure itself is the problem and it kind of I don't know how defunding would work logistically when defunding has been a stick with which to kind of manipulate those en own ends like it's a sticky one basically yeah, and the question of um, the provocation of defunding also comes with the provocation of then what do you fund and how do you redistribute those resources to those most impacted by austerity, by a conservative government, by immigration policies, um, yeah, by transphobic attitudes. Yeah, it's a, that's a big question, Cecilia. Um, does anyone else want to respond to that? Or we can um, just that. just very quickly like there are i know in ireland they i i 
I like the idea of this model instead. I don't know how successful it would be, um, whereby the Arts Council does not fund like institutions and organizations they fund artists and like local authorities will fund the institutions and something about that seems like a lit like s- slightly better uh, just in the sense that like you know there are these very disparate arts council england um officers and for example the north west is in manchester so uh, but so everything goes to Manchester, <laughs> like Liverpool, 40 minutes uh, away. It, it has like a completely different experience of, of that funding. Um, and I just wonder whether a local council uh, shape would, would be better. I don't know, though. Thanks, Gabrielle. I'm going to move us to another question. Um, this from... Ellis and also Cleo, um, who are both asking about what does solidarity look like, especially when we are all isolated and yet connected online. How do we build collectivity? How do we build solidarity? Um, And I'm wondering if maybe um, Jade Montserrat, Annika and um, Tunde um, and Seda can, can speak to that. I think it's just creating space to recognize the different perspectives that are, are there because even in, in the previous discussion about doing the work, like what does it mean to do the work? I mean, for some, you know, institutions or organization doing the work is just giving money away and just, you know, doing a few things for Black History Month and, and that's it. Um, so just in terms of solidarity, it's creating space to sort of engage with different perspectives um, so that in in terms of like long term there's like more sustainability um, that can be achieved. Um, Yeah, I I think that there's a lot of, yeah, there's just a lot of, a a lot of things that are occurring in terms of money being thrown, meetings wanting to take place, events wanting to happen. And if all of these things aren't sort of, if the basics aren't sort of being checked, then then it kind of just feels a bit showy um, and, and mismatched. So returning to the basics. Jade or Tunde and Seda? Sure. Um. I I think I spoke I I spoke about solidarity in a <clears throat> uh, something called parallel state I think uh, maybe Sheffield um, I I wrote about it a little bit it's really difficult to find I'm interested in sort of picking up on what you meant Gabrielle about because I think that leads into solidarity about uh like your role in my case like um i i yeah i i sort of refute the the premise that you were speaking on then that uh because for me like the solidarity that i found in relation to that has been sort of you know, widespread sort of people sort of uh, picking what they want to um, show, demonstrate solidarity on. Uh, uh, That doesn't apply to to you, but I I, I do sort of, you know, I'd be interested in having sort of clarification about what you meant just then about that particular post. But um, like, it's very difficult to, um, maybe convey everyone's individual circumstances as well, because we relate it to ourselves, right? Uh, trying to measure what s- solidarity can be in terms of h- how you can actually implement that. The idea of refusal or whatever is all well and good. Practically, it's 
really impossible if you're not sort of socially mobile. What you were talking about, about um, sort of back to basics again, this idea of reviewing what it is that, and who it, we're being um, in solidarity with. Um, I, I think that, you know, for me and uh, what Gabrielle was referring to is totally sort of um, located in the, in the UK as well. And I, I, I'm interested in how it connects, really interesting that you bring up Ireland and, and how um, organisations or public funded organizations uh, uh, um, their models could be possibly applied to here or elsewhere um, I was really interested also in Jade's speaking about the idea of radical love and I suppose if we have to talk about Tate today um, that they, you know, they're doing a whole program on that's called a year of love, um, and I think that what I may be seeing is that we have a very we have very different ideas around love as well, or, or uh, loving in solidarity, or uh, you know, um, and I think that the communities and, and the position that Jade is coming from, Jade Foster, it's very different from any perception of what love has the possibility to be um, institutionally or structurally. I think there's a complete dissonance and I think there's a displaced responsibility whereby we can talk about things. I, I'm, I, I, uh, I think that solidarity as well is action. Um, maybe, it's more difficult for, well, it's difficult for every one of us to call things out, you know, and sometimes that can feel like you're dying. And I don't advocate that to anybody. I don't advocate having to show like, um, sort of uh, bleed your emotions online with which to get anyone to pay any, notice solidarity for me is maybe something quite sacred in that it's not it's not something that you will see necessarily it's not something that will be demonstrated or displayed or it's not a performance uh, so that's yeah i think that's my take on it thank you jade and i think this can be a space where we do not need to talk about tape anymore um but thank you for sharing those, yeah, those really powerful ideas around solidarity, not as a performance, something is sac something sacred. Um, Tuna and Seda, would you like to share? Um, it's a bit of a long story, but let's like try to jump in from an outsider's perspective as people who are new to the UK. What you see as someone new to the whole scene is that there has been some uh, institutional structural problems that have been going on for some time uh, and some new things that are happening at the moment as well. Uh, and I think that when you see all of them as new, you get the picture where, for instance, when we are talking about defunding uh, as a way of making things go a bit more faster, from, uh, from the perspective of an outsider, I can also sort of see that actually the UK might be very happy with with defunding art of any kind uh, and that when we start to sort of pick on institutions on how much lip service uh, they're actually paying and not doing real things I uh, sort of also see that some institutions have stopped paying that lip service even, which is, I think, much more a dangerous step towards uh, where we're going. For instance, we have been talking about Black History Month and now the government is like saying things like um, talking about this in schools uh, in a way might be uh, considered illegal even. So uh, it seems like 
as an outsider, it seems like we're moving towards a phase when uh, even lip service is going to look like something we uh, would want, basically. But as I said, it might just be how you feel when you're overwhelmed with everything, with the history and the new stuff as well. But um, yes, so in terms of solidarity, maybe um, there needs to be like a bigger picture in the sense that there might be a time coming where the entire art uh, institution as a whole might have to be protected. Uh, and uh, even lip service is will have to be sort of like something that you look at I don't know, but this is like a bit of a more pessimistic outlook, uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's like, it's quite, it's quite a realistic outlook, because like, as you were saying that, I remembered as well, that like, um, I think the National Trust are being, are currently being investigated, or they're calling the Charity Commission to investigate them for not fulfilling the terms of their charitable aims because they're taking a closer look at national trust buildings and their their role and um, place in the history of colonialism and slavery like that the, it's the proximity of the state and the state's own interests that this particular government's interests are, are like it, it's too close it's too close and like you're right in saying that like calls to defund can be taken the other way like it's I think, I think calls to defund have to be quite carefully phrased because while we might understand it to mean one thing, God knows Tories have been, <laughs> have been fucking raring at the bit to defund the arts in exactly the same way, yeah. Yeah, and that's a, a, a really good um, point towards at the same time of trying to create accountability um, in decision makers who currently hold power we also have to recognize that, yeah, we're, as a culture sector, we do have to collectivize our struggles. Um, and sometimes these binaries are, are, are not useful. I mean, you know, the, the, the critique and the, the call for action is completely valid, but yeah, just trying to create two categories of, <laughs> of art beings, <laughs> institutions and artists is sometimes unproductive. Um, and like you said, Zarina, the conservative government is rearing to destroy the Arts Council. Um, so working with them to transform how they fund and redistribute resources is, is, is needed. And I just want us maybe to bring it back to how we will be spending our time over winter and what 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 practices will be what will we be what will we be putting in practice over this winter um, that opens new doors um, rather than closes them so I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from from each of you what will you be putting into practice across this winter I might, um, I got in touch with a guy called Alan yesterday who lives in Hull who might have a border terrier for me. So I intend going out and doing more walks. Amazing. Me as well. I'm, I've signed up for a nine week um, black women's hiking group in, in London. So I'm going to be learning about navigating through forests. And I'm also learning Yoruba, which is my mother tongue, so yeah, connecting to ancestry as well as, as being outdoors. Uh, me and Serena always take December's off, uh, which I'm looking forward to. Um, it can be a bit full on when your job is like 24 seven because it's on the internet. Um, I will be playing the new Zelda game on Nintendo Switch. <laughs> I'm gonna spend my December break doing sweet soddle. I mean, I feel like we have accrued the holiday to like have an actual rest. Like, can you imagine? I'm not gonna log on to anywhere. 
well, we, we come from a culture where there is no Christmas and we're still trying to get used to it. Um, right when we were trying to get used to it, now it might be cancelled. So <laughs> we're a bit, uh, but we, that's why I think we're going to be working. We, we've just opened a new uh, digital platform and uh, exhibition with Arts Council funding, I must say. Uh, and so uh, it's going to be open throughout this yeah. December and there's going to be like live streaming performances as well. So we're, we're working, it seems, yeah. I'm going to spend some time um, drinking. I think I'm going to take Gabrielle's uh, lovely suggestion about just getting pissed once uh, to sustain yourself but um nah nah um bit of whiskey bit of rum lots of really good food um some curry mutton spice and peas you know some planting food for the soul um and then probably like i might watch that in sunset back to reality tv um again because like, I've watched season three I think it's season three now isn't it but I'm gonna re-watch it um I think and yeah just um spending time with people who want to hold space for me and vice versa um nurturing people just exchange of really good energies um and just being around people just to ground myself really so December is a month of grounding, I think. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation and, and in each track or question, feel, feel like we could have spent a lot longer speaking about it. Um, so thank you for your honesty um, and integrity um, and generosity today.